Hey everybody, on this episode we're going to talk about training the contralateral limb after an injury, finding a job for a good fit for you, and restoring motion in somebody with hip impingement. The Ask Mike Reinhold Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Ask Mike Reinald podcast. Mike Reinald here. I'm with Lenny McCrina. What's up? What's up? I had an itchy ankle. Sorry. What's up? We got <laughs> the Gabinator here. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But you're, you're the, Episode five, right? Episode five. So this is when the Empire Strikes Back, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Episode five, the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> We're gonna go with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would you be Would you be a rebel or would you be What's the other ones? They're Rebels and then the Empire. Yeah. But then in the new one, they're different. Spoiler alert! (laughs) Spoiler Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. In the new one, they're different, right? I'm still trying to figure it out. (laughs) Ah, Crazy. Uh, Welcome back, everybody. Um, We are busting away at this podcast. Uh, Hope you guys are enjoying and doing this here. Uh, We get another uh, few great questions for today. So, Gabe, let's start it up, buddy. All right. First one comes from Norway. Norway, we're getting a lot of international ones. I like that. Good stuff, Norway. What's his name? Uh, Joe Hagen. Joe, what's up, Joe? Thanks for submitting a uh, question. What is your view of unilateral strength training on the contralateral side, and do you implement it in your training program for athletes slash clients? All right, what is your view on unilateral training on the contralateral side, and do you use it with who? Do you implement it in your training program for athletes and clients? And do you do that with athletes and clients? All right, so uh, what I would assume you're saying, if, the, if you're talking contralateral, I assume you're, you're saying that there's an injury. So like, right. like you hurt your left leg, and your question is, um, do you work on the right leg? So wow, Gabe, I need your input here. Um, going back to neuroanatomy here, um, the desiccation, right? Of uh, <laughs> stumped. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, a lot of your motor fibers desiccate and or don't desiccate. This is not my world, as you're as you're figuring out here, right? So there is a certain amount of fibers that don't cross over to the other side, right? So this was back. This is we were talking about this in the '90s about like, um, you know, does training on the 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 contralateral side actually increase strength because of some of those those things? Um, so I, I would say there's definitely some merit to it. Um, I don't know if that's the scientific reason. I I would also throw in there I think it's really funny when people say like single leg training and think that the rest of the body is just completely not involved you know like a rear foot elevated split squat is probably the most common one where we're talking about you know you know why can somebody lift if you add up the weight that you can do on the left and the right on a rear foot elevated split squat split squat why can you do more than a back squat well because you're using your entire body you're not just using your left leg and then your right leg versus the two together. You know, when I do things like reverse lunges, rear foot elevated, um, I feel just as much on my moving leg, my lunging leg, than my, my plant leg. You know, so I think it's pretty fictitious to think that there's anything as a single leg. So um, I would say we write our programs very balanced. So absolutely we're working on the other side. Um, what's the fear, right? We talked about this with the shoulder. So what's the fear that you get too strong on the other side? Right. Like, I'm not worried about that. So. Right. I think it's I think it's great. I think yeah, you want to work on balance. We do it all the time. It's a normal part of our progression. Yeah, definitely. And, and there is research that shows you sprain your ankle, you have an ACL tear, you get proprioceptive deficits on the contralateral side. Very so, good point. Very good you know, point. It, uh, definitely recommend. Yeah. You know, contralateral training, if that's what you want to call it, for a yeah. contralateral injury. That's so. a good story. I yeah. might go off. To, off off topic. <laughs> so I'll go off topic. <laughs> There's a good story by that. So in the early 2000s, we actually tried to start this study on proprioception. So what, what we were doing was we were trying to test kids. You know, we, in, in Birmingham, we, we, cover, we talk about Birmingham a lot, but in, in Birmingham, we, we covered like 35 sidelines every Friday night in high school football. So we had this like Petri dish of kids that we could use. But what we did is if a kid tore their ACL on Friday, we tried to test them Saturday morning and we tested their proprioception side to side. And we wanted to follow that to see if their proprioception changed. And what we found was the proprioception on the good leg went down too. So what happens sometimes is the good leg actually gets worse, and I don't know if there's some central mediation. We've kind of talked about that a little bit if it goes down. But the funny story is it was very hard to get subjects for that. 
very hard to get people that wanted to come in like six hours after they tore their ACL. They're still depressed. You know, their football career, their high school football career is over, which is a pretty big thing in Alabama. But they um, they were pretty depressed in Georgia. Sorry, Gabe. Um, uh, they were pretty depressed, and, and we were trying to do the study and follow them up. So we had two subjects. You remember this? Were you part of this? No, was, was this before you? Before so subject one was Kevin Wilk's son, gotcha. and subject two was Dr. Andrews' daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's really all we did. I think we may have, we may have done a little bit more. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> but it was it. super interesting. But we showed the proprioception. We were using the biodex stability machine. Kind of went down. So there's some sort of central mediation. So to make a long story long. Yes. We're good at that. <laughs> Gabe. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kelly Barber from Linwood, Washington. She asks, I'm a PTA and moved about one year ago. I worked at a privately owned outpatient PT clinic for 15 months prior to moving. This job was offered me prior to graduation, therefore I did not have to apply or job search. My question is, how do I go about finding a job with a good fit? Right. So Kelly, right? Kelly. Kelly, PTA from Washington. Washington. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, good question. I yeah. like that. So, Kelly, you settled on a job. Sounds like it's not a good fit right now. Or is she moving? Uh, I want to say this is... She worked at a place for 15 months, and now she's looking for another place. Okay, all right. So yeah. I, I thought she was moving okay. or something, but that's fine. So okay. I mean, right. to me... Whew. Uh, friends, social media, you know, putting words out, trying to do research on what good clinics are. You get a, it's going to be difficult if you're going, if you're moving or you know, trying to find a, um, a clinic that fits you. I don't know what that means, fitting you, but um, what's, what's your passion? What are you trying to get into sports medicine? Are you trying to get into a fast paced clinic? I doubt it. Um, are you trying to get into physician owned? Who knows? I mean, I don't know what, what the goal is, but social media and connections within the organization and going to meetings and talking to people, uh, that might be a good avenue. Um, and just word of mouth to me and then visiting, you know, and just interviewing and visiting and spending a day with the clinic, get a good vibe on what's going on in the clinic and, and talking to the staff and, and, and just getting their, their ideas and their goals and well, how long they've been there. If they've been there five, ten years, that's a good sign that they're happy. Um, I don't know if you yeah. have anything else, but you know, that's if I was going back through the job search again, then that's something that I would do. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a challenge. I can't imagine, especially if it's a, a distance where you, if you're moving and you got to go somewhere else or fly there. And, um, I wish right. I had a better answer. Yeah, I mean, it, as new grads, I'd say the majority of new grads, you, you get your positions. Um, you know, through clinical rotations or right. things you did in school, so they know you, you know them, you, and everybody knows it's a good fit. So that that's where the majority of jobs come from. So I, I get where your question's coming from is yeah. that's the logical best fit. So now you have to do the reverse hack in my mind. So as an employer, you know, what do we do? I mean, well, we'll stalk you on Facebook for a little bit. We're going to look at your social media profiles to see what what you what's your character like, what are your what what are your core values and stuff like that on social media. Um, I think you should do the same thing. Things. Check out their web page. Do you believe in what they're saying? Look, but more importantly, try to find them on social media. Do they not have social media? I think that's a red flag nowadays. You know, but follow them. Follow their Twitter. Follow their Instagram account and see what you can find. And say, does this look like the culture I want? You know, can I learn from these people? Am I going to be stuck in a hole by myself? So yeah. Um, yeah, so tough one, but I mean totally doable. And yeah. then I, I would I would also say too, like it's okay being a free agent, you know. So find a place if it's not the best fit, just keep looking. You can yeah. always keep looking, and yeah. you, you'll find the fit. So, but yeah, no good good ideas from Len. Reach out to your friends, but I would say just do as much investigation on the place and see is is it a place you want to work at? You have to think mentally. You're kind of interviewing pre-interviewing them. You got to think of that. Is this a place I want to work? Not vice versa. Yeah. So a different approach, but. Yeah. All right, Gabe. All right. Josh Elman from Fairfield, Ohio. <clears throat> what would be your keys to regaining range of motion for conservative treatments of FAI? So how do you how do you range of motion for conservative so non-operative FAI so femoroacetabular impingement which is I think we're finding more and more common in people. Len right. Len's actually um, got a couple of couple of people right now doing some post-op stuff. Post-op stuff. We had him pre-op. I think he in his head he had said he was having surgery. And I, so I think pre-op it's a lot of education. Um, obviously letting them know that it's normal to have impingement if you want to call it impingement and that there's it's not a a, a, a given that he's going to have surgery or she's going to have surgery, uh, especially depending on the sport they're getting back to. But to me, it's 
I keep a simple approach as normal. It's, it's restoring what range of motion I think they, they should have. I look contralateral side. I look at their function. I look at their sport. I look at them in uh, squatting. I look at them doing, I'm an SFMA kind of guy, so I want to see if there's anything that jumps out. Are they compensating uh, during a squat? They have t they have tightness elsewhere. They have uh, tightness in the low back. They have tightness in the thoracic spine. They have tightness in their ankle. Uh, what's their joint capsule like in their hip? If, we, if they have bony impingement, that's not something that we can overcome, but I think we can make efforts to work and improve some of their range of motion. They probably have some uh, strength deficits, uh, so working on some of that, and then getting them confident, getting them feeling like they're back, they're strong again, uh, getting them trying to uh, simulate their sport, whether they're running, cutting, jumping, pivoting, whatever they got to do, and, and then getting them the mental component, getting them confident in getting back to where they need to be. But uh, a lot of hands-on stuff, a lot of soft tissue work, joint mobs, and then again, progress them through a strengthening program. That was pretty thorough. That was a lot. That was how to rehab an FAI yeah, from yeah. start to finish right there. Um, I, I, I would just say, too, remember that FAI is impingement, and maximizing their range of motion isn't always your goal because the end range of their motion is probably some sort of impingement either in their cam or pincer lesion or whatever or you're you're kind of you're hitting their acetabulum um, or, or their labrum I should say um, I think you got to be careful with that so um, sometimes it's not maximizing the range of motion I would rather I, I'm gonna flip your thought process and say I want you to maximize their alignment is what I want you to have first. So if they have a huge anterior pelvic tilt, they're going to have reduced hip flexion range of motion. They're going to have some issues with that. So rather focus on just jamming them into hip flexion where you, you're just going to get impingement, I'd focus on getting them more posteriorly tilted, posterior dominant in there so that way that frees up more available functional range of motion. So it's not just forcing it through their anatomy. There's a reason they're there. It's about you know maybe putting them in a better position to succeed. Yeah. Uh, for example, doing a sumo squat versus a uh, straight forward, uh, slightly externally rotated squat. You may create a little more space in the hip to get a little deeper to get potentially a little more strength gains and a deeper range of motion. For an example, you know you don't always have to function in a in that uh, single squat position. You get to find their range of motion that they are comfortable in and the available range of motion that's not going to further propagate the symptoms. Yeah, work in their functional yeah. range. I think that to maximize their functional range, not ne range, not necessarily just jam them into end range. So. Is that it? That, that was it. That was it. Awesome. Questions. Jeez, that flew. Yeah. Flew. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it so much. Uh, we're having a blast. I hope you guys are enjoying as well. Um, we appreciate feedback. Give us some feedback. But more importantly, we need questions. We need reviews on iTunes. That's a big one for us. We want to get that up there so more people can get exposed to this and they can learn from us. Uh, learn more about asking us questions and some stuff about us. MikeReynold.com slash podcast. Or you can ask us questions on Twitter using the hashtag AskMikeReynold. Um, um, yeah, that's Episode it. five done. Empire uh, yeah. Strikes yeah. Back. That's and, uh, right. Return, Return of the, the Jedi, Jedi next time. <laughs> <laughs>